It's good to see so many people here on this uh, sunny evening um, for what is really quite an interesting, interesting subject um, and a very deep one. So in the span of under an hour, it's, it's difficult to do much more than an introduction. Uh, but my hope is to at least give a good introduction that will help us to understand a little bit about Hermes Trismegistus and fundamentally the, the seven principles or keys of life, which are expressed uh, and explained through the Kabbalion. To start, uh, I'll invite you to a journey to Egypt um, to understand Hermeticism, the Hermetic tradition and philosophy. Uh, we have to go back to ancient Egypt uh, as a starting point and understand a little bit the, the civilization, the culture, uh, above all the mentality of ancient Egypt. There's a lot of mysteries there. Uh, even still today, uh, Egypt holds a certain mystery, a certain enigmatic quality that, that inspires us and compels us. And it's clear from, from looking at their, their heritage, their culture, their symbols, they had a very different understanding of, of life in general than, than we have today. One that was very symbolic, um, that was very much rooted in the sacred. Uh, which is a, a, a fundamental concept in understanding Hermeticism and, and a lot of ancient philosophies, really. If we look at how anthropology would define the sacred, um, there's many interesting aspects that have been well documented on this concept, which is fundamentally an essential need that the human being has to connect with something that is beyond the here and now beyond the, the material, beyond the physical. Uh, this is something that has often been expressed through religion, but it's not exclusively religious. Uh, we can call it spirituality, but even that, I think today, requires some explanation because our understanding of that, our definition of that varies. So to, to look at spirituality from this philosophical perspective, we would look at, well, the root of the word, in Latin, spiritus, meaning breath. Um, the spirit and what is spiritual has always been understood by ancient civilizations as that which animates, which uh, gives life, which gives that impulse of life. And in many traditions, some in the East, they've also described this impulse as intelligence, which is interesting. We don't normally think of spirit as intelligence, but they describe it as this this life force that exists uh, behind all things that is guiding life with a harmonious order and intelligence that we can also call evolution. So it's a way of understanding spirit as something that we experience through the intelligence of nature. And that is something that is a, a foundational idea in a lot of what we see in the Kabbalion. We can also call this consciousness, if you prefer. Sometimes words have associations that we're not always comfortable with. Consciousness is talking about the same thing. It's an inner impulse of evolution that's driving us. And when we talk about evolution philosophically, what we're really talking about is the development of consciousness. The forms evolve, yes, but there's an inner movement, an inner growth that we're interested in understanding as well. So this sacred vision of life, we can say that the Egyptians had other traditions too, was transmitted through a system of education that uh, anthropologists describe as initiatical. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. But fundamentally, the, the system of transmission of these ideas from masters to disciples uh, through various schools and orders, like in Egypt, uh, the, the schools of Eleusis in Greece, um, the Mithric or Mithraic schools of Persia. There's a number of different examples throughout antiquity of these systems of education. And what's common in various ways, a common thread through all of them, are influences of this hermetic tradition, which is attributed to the, the master, the wise sage, Hermes Trismegistus. When we talk about hermeticism, there's there's a number of texts that are commonly referenced. The Corpus Hermeticum, 
the Emerald Tablet, and of course the Cabalion. Corpus Hermeticum is, is referring to Corpus's body. It's a body of hermetic knowledge. That's the, the most content relating to hermeticism that is known. The Emerald Tablet, uh, an ancient document that um, its historical origins are unclear, but uh, it was deemed to have originated from Arabia uh, in the 8th, 9th century. Um, of course, probably older than that, but that's when it emerged. The Kabbalion then is a more modern text, as we'll see. It's, it acts as a, a summary and a synthesis of a lot of hermetic ideas, um, which makes it a fantastic entry point into hermeticism. And so what is that? What is uh, the hermetic philosophy? What is the, the fundamental uh, principle or, or proposition in synthesis, what we're provided with is a vision of life based on understanding seven key principles or universal laws. And in this way, it's really a kind of a staggering work of simplicity because within the teachings of Hermeticism, the entire universe is explained in seven principles. And that sounds like a pretty a uh, tall order. How can you sum up the entire universe in seven principles? What's interesting in, in philosophy and the search for wisdom, in reality, the, the truth, and we could maybe say truth with a capital T, is often very simple. Our, our desire to know, our projected desires, uh, the analytical mind can often overcomplicate things, but the reality is often very simple. And that's not to confuse simple with easy. Because even though these ideas may be simple, they're not always easy. They're not always easy to understand. They're not always easy above all to practice. And so with any text like the Kabbalion, there is a process of reflection, uh, observation, introspection, and above all, practice. Because philosophy, as Julia was mentioning in, in the introduction, in the classical sense, it's not purely an intellectual exercise. It is not only about studying. You could read the Kabbalion cover to cover and still not do anything with it. But to read, to understand the Kabbalion, to understand these principles is to observe them in ourselves, in others, in nature. And through that observation, through our own reflection to put them into practice. And we'll see as we go through the seven keys what that practice might imply. But first to continue with a little bit more context, we'll talk about Hermes Trismegistus himself. And here we have um, a historical figure, a mythological figure, uh, a deified figure, there's a lot of ways of understanding Hermes Trismegistus. A lot of them are symbolic, but they all help us to understand a little bit the importance and the significance of his work. And as we started with Egypt, it's, it's useful to, to continue to understand um, as Hermes is deemed to have been born out of Egypt and out of the mystery traditions in Egypt. So these, these ideas, talking about things that are initiatical schools of mystery, what does that mean? The mystery here is not just, you know, a whodunit. It's not a thing to be resolved. Mystery, the origin of the word, which is related to mystique in ancient Greek, they mean roughly the same thing, which is about a, a divine ascension. So that mystique, that mystery that, that compels us, that inspires us, it's about an ascension of consciousness. For the Greeks, they said the ascension of the soul. So the schools of mysteries provided a, a method of education that enabled people to accelerate their conscious evolution. That is to say, to grow as individuals. 
but in a way that that has largely been lost today this system of education we can understand it in theory but uh in practice there's very little um relationship between that and modern education well really none at all but it's a system that schools of philosophy have continued to do, to practice and and promote even since the days of ancient egypt so this concept of what is initiatical then to be initiated and even using the technical use of the word to initiate something is to begin you initiate a task a process but to initiate in uh, this this sense is to begin a, a journey to begin a path to be initiated into a new way of thinking so we can initiate ourselves to new behaviors to new thought forms and the purpose of schools of mysteries was to initiate people into a higher state of consciousness to leave behind an old skin an old persona an old layer of ignorance And so this emphasis on, on education, this daily, uh, the, the regularity of the sacred in Egyptian culture meant that it was something very normal. Um, the concept of religion was very different. There was no word in ancient Egypt for religion because their practice and experience of the sacred was so commonplace that they didn't need the word. It was simply something that they lived and embodied. And so in the midst of all this, there was a, a certain figure deemed so important that he was immortalized in the image of one of the Egyptian divinities. So this is referring to the Egyptian god Toth. If you know Egyptian, uh, the pantheon at all, Toth was represented as with the body of a man, the, bird, the head of an ibis bird. And this practice of elevating someone to the status of a god was not totally uncommon in ancient cultures um in ancient china this was something that happened more than once where a certain great master a great general someone that had a huge historical impact was later revered almost as a god so this figure of hermes that we're trying to understand a little bit was a communicator of these universal ideas this essential universal knowledge. And so the Egyptian god Toth was a representation of, of that and the attributes of that included uh, that Toth had created language. He was considered to have been the one that created the hieroglyphs, the language of the people. He was the god of knowledge. He was the scribe. He was the god that was present at the weighing of the heart which was part of the, their understanding of the, the kind of myth around transitioning to the other side after death. Toth was a god related to, to karma, to justice, and he was there taking account of everything that happened in a person's life. One of the symbolic elements of the ibis bird is, is the beak. If you know the ibis, it is a long, um, a long kind of pointed, narrow, thin beak. And this allowed it to uh, penetrate into anthills easily to pick out its food. So this gives a, an image of discernment, the ability to penetrate and to separate. Discernment or intelligence from the Latin intelligare, meaning to, um, excuse me, to, I've lost it. To choose from excuse me to be able to choose from and that's the essence of discernment that we're able to see and understand what is good from what is not good to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff as we commonly say so that's an important distinction between intelligence and an intellect there's nothing to do with intellectual acumen or accumulating knowledge intelligence is related to the ability to act wisely
So the, the Egyptian influence was immense in antiquity. Uh, later, the Greeks would adopt Hermes um, and they would adapt Hermes. And this is something also that's quite normal, quite human, to take symbolic content, to take something that represents the metaphysical, again, the sacred, something that goes beyond the here and now. We always take it and we adapt it in a way that makes it more culturally palatable that fits more our vision. Because for the Egyptians, a very symbolic people, this idea of the ibis bird representing Toth made perfect sense. The Greeks, more rational, uh, a little bit more pragmatic, for them that, that doesn't work. So Hermes then, Toth becomes Hermes, the god, the messenger god with the winged sandals and many of the same attributes, also considered to have created language. He's a communicator, patron of travelers, of wisdom. And Hermes, of course, would later become Mercury in Rome. So all of this suggests that there's something significant, something special about this Hermes Trismegistus. And is this a person? Is this many people? There's a lot of different theories about whether he ever existed, whether it was a group of people, and Hermes Trismegistus was actually more like a generic title, which was given to certain initiates, high priests. Similar theories exist in other cultures. Uh, when we look at the father of Taoism in China, Lao Tzu, similar idea. Zarathustra in Persia often believed that multiple people carried that name but there's also a strong contention that there was at least one foundational Hermes Trismegistus, one person who embodied that wisdom, that system of, of transmission, and created that legacy, which lasted for thousands and thousands of years and continues to today. In terms of historical information, again, many different theories, lots of debate, nothing is conclusive. Um, he's believed to have existed at different stages throughout Egypt's history. One of the most recent accounts, as in historically recent, was that he existed somewhere around 1200 BC. Uh, some accounts placing him as a master to Moses. So that gives a rough idea of the, the timeline. The name itself, Trismegistus, means thrice great or thrice blessed, three times initiated. So it's a, a title referring to his somewhat exalted status as a master of wisdom. Okay, so that's about as much as we know in summary. There's a lot more details, but a lot of it is um, theory and a lot of it are symbolic. So it's, it's to give us an initial starting point of understanding a little bit about where this knowledge is coming from. And then the style, the approach, what is hermeticism? You may be familiar with the concept of something being hermetically sealed. Uh, this is a, a, a container that leaves nothing out. If something is in a hermetically sealed, pressurized container, it can't escape. And this uh, originates from the concept of hermeticism for a, a fundamental reason, which is based on its oral transmission or oral tradition. And again, this is something that is, is very commonplace in antiquity. These teachings were passed on from master to disciple orally. They were memorized and they continued to be passed on without necessarily being written down. And in some cases for centuries, nothing was documented. It was treated as such a sacred uh, teaching that it could only be spoken and memorized. To write it down would be in a way to desanctify it. But it got written down, obviously, so what happened? What we see historically is in the cycles of civilizations, there's always a decline. And in this period of decline, there is a forgetting. There is a loss of knowledge. Through decadence, there is always a loss of knowledge. 
So it's through those periods that the sages, the schools at the time see the risk, the possibility of losing it. And so it gets written down to protect it. What is that to do with hermetically sealed? Well, because the knowledge is only passed, as they say in the Kabbalion, from the lips of the wise to the ears of the understanding. So hermeticism was safeguarded. The result of the ultimate documenting of these teachings is the Corpus Hermeticum, the Emerald Tablet. But even then, the texts themselves more or less vanished. Uh, through the Middle Ages, these things were very obscure, um, pretty hidden, and ultimately protected because in the medieval times, particularly with the power of the church and the inquisition, these teachings would have been deemed heretical and those practicing them would have been uh, you know, persecuted. How did they survive? Well, they were transmitted in hiding through secret lodges, through uh, guilds, through masons, and the teachings which became a lot of the basis of what we, we look at now historically as medieval alchemy, uh, survived through these schools and their practices. Alchemy, fascinating subject in itself, worthy of, of a, a talk unto itself, but rather than um, dwelling on the, the material aspect of, the, well, the classic thing is lead into gold, for the hermetic tradition, what's being transmuted is the mind. As we'll see in Hermeticism, everything is about the mental plane. Anything that happens external to that is because of what originates in the mind. But the, the transformation or transmutation that we're more interested in is the lead of our defects, our shortcomings, into the gold of our potential, our virtues. Coming out of the medieval period into the Renaissance, there's a revival of hermetic tradition. Uh, key figures like Marsilio Ficino, one of the great fathers of the Renaissance, translated the Corpus Hermeticum into Latin. It became readily available for the first time in centuries. And that inspiration went on to lead a lot of the thinking and the works of the Renaissance. The Kabbalion itself, then, uh, is a text compiled in the 20th century, written in 1908, attributed to three initiates, so essentially written anonymously. And there's a number of theories, again, as to who authored the Kabbalion. Uh, some believe one particular figure uh, was all three initiates. Some believe it was members of the Theosophical Society. There's no clear uh, answer to that. It's not that important. What they did was they took key extracts from hermetic teachings and they explained them in reasonably simple way. I mean, it's 1908, so it's, it's, a, it's a different language than today, but it's not too complicated. What they do is they present these seven laws to help us understand the application of hermeticism today. Why is it seven? Why seven? That's often a question, and I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. Seven is a very interesting symbolic number that appears everywhere in nature. There's the seven colors of the rainbow. There's seven scales in music, seven groups of um, elements in the periodic table. In sacred numerology, uh, three is symbolic of the spirit, the invisible plane, four is symbolic of material, materialization. So three and four together is seven, which encompasses everything in the universe. So when you observe these things in nature, seven interestingly appears. It, it appears almost like it's a building block. It's, it's a, a structure. Why seven? I don't know. But we have seven laws, seven principles explaining the fundamental workings of the universe. Again, sounds like a tall order, but we'll see 
what they explain in that. Okay, so the seven principles of the Kabbalion. We'll start with the first, the principle of mentalism, which explains that the all is mind, the universe is mental. Now for the Irish natives, this is not to be understood as the universe is bloody mental. The universe is not a mad yoke. The universe is based on the mind. The all is mind. What is the all? In the Kabbalion, what they describe as the all is substantial reality. So everything that exists, everything that is real has a form of substance. Our tendency is to focus on matter because our somewhat materialistic conditioning and our hyper rationalistic approach to life means that we only see what we can touch as having substance. But we know scientifically that you know there's more to life than just matter. There's also energy. There are different forms of energy that we can measure, so we understand those. The hermetic tradition goes a step further and says that there's more subtle planes beyond energy that are also real and have, in a way, a form of substance, such as our emotions and the mind. So they're subtle. They're intangible to us. They're what we can say metaphysical. They go beyond the physical plane, but they're real. And we can say that ideas are real because we, well, we experience them. But what we tend to think is that ideas happen because we think them. That ideas are just electrical, chemical impulses from the biological organ. If ideas or if the, the universe is mental, the whole uh, structure is based on an idea, then the ideas have a reality. Plato describes it this way. Plato studied a lot in Egypt, and he talks about the intelligible world, the world of archetypes, the world of ideas. And we're more like a receptor. He doesn't quite use that analogy. They didn't have radios back then, but we're like a receptor and we're receiving ideas. The archetypes. Carl Jung is another example, as a more modern example, a psychologist talking about the collective unconscious. These ideas exist independently of us, but when we think them, we're channeling them. We draw them to us, and perhaps there's a level of creativity because we marry ideas in different ways, which then creates a result. There's an action. But what it implies is that the idea comes first, always the idea first. Without the idea, nothing else exists. This is very different from our material conception of life, which is more Aristotelian, not to get too much into that, that distinction, but Aristotle looked at things from the bottom up. Plato, like Hermes, looks at things from the top down. And if we understand the top-down vision of life, then we, see, we can see where things originate from. The Buddhists similarly explain the importance of our mental plane, that our ideas, our perceptions, form our reality. And I think we understand this, perhaps psychologically, maybe from our own experience. Our mindset determines a lot. You can face the same situation with a positive mindset looking for solutions or a negative mindset looking to criticize and justify. And it can be the same situation, but you experience it two very different ways because of the mindset. Also important in understanding that the, the plane of the, the universe is mental is that the mental forms that we have the ideas that we receive, are, are they ours? Am I thinking for myself? Or am I simply following the thoughts that are being pushed on me from the world around me? Okay, so that's the first. And in a way, it's maybe the most important to understand because it's the, the foundation of the rest. If we understand that ideas exist independently of us, 
and that everything is based on an idea, then the rest, we can start to see how it connects. The second principle then is the principle of correspondence, which states as above, so below, as below, so above. Maybe one of the most famous hermetic maxims, as above, so below. So what do they explain here? Well, first, they're saying the universe is mental, the universe is mind. Secondly, everything is connected. As above, so below. A lot of ancient traditions have explained in different ways that the universe is a living being. This is mind blowing for us because the universe is so vast, it's incomprehensible. But it is essentially a macrobios. It's a living organism. It's full of life that's interconnected, like organs, the galaxies, the nebula, even what we call space, the vacuum in between. The hermetic tradition describes that as a very subtle substance that's connecting everything together. And as part of the universe, we're like a mini universe, the microcosm. Everything that's happening within the human being is a reflection of everything that happens in nature. What it explains is that everything is interconnected and interrelated. The difference is just a matter of scale. I know that's easy to say, but if you take an atom, an atom is a nucleus in the center, surrounded by atoms, uh, surrounded by um, electrons. And all of that's held together by a, an imperceptible layer of surface tension. That's an atom. The solar system is the same. The sun is like the nucleus. Planets revolve around it like electrons. And it is encased in what astrophysics call the heliopass, this kind of shield that's protecting it from cosmic rays. So you've got an atom and you've got the solar system. And the structure is the same. So this correspondence is suggesting that everything is interrelated. Everything is a reflection of everything else, which tells us that these principles apply to everything. The laws of life, uh, you know, don't pick people as special targets. The laws that apply to the universe apply to us because we're part of nature. Our ego, which tends to separate things, separates us and we think we have our own laws. We've got our own rules. These things don't apply to me. But then what happens? Well, we suffer because we're going against the natural principles of life. In Greece, they understood this. They said famously, know thyself and you will know the universe and the gods. Or we can translate that, understand yourself and you will understand nature and its laws. Because the gods, we can understand as, as archetypes, they're representations of laws and principles. So if I understand myself, if I understand how the laws of life impact me, I can understand a little bit how they impact others, nature, the universe. So it's a, an interesting concept practice to observe how how integrated am I in life? How much do I separate? How much do I divide? If my liver decided it didn't want to be a part of the body anymore, that would not be good. Interconnection is part of life. But we have this tendency for various reasons to separate, to divide. Okay, so first, the universe is mental, cosmic mind. Second, everything is connected. Third, the principle of vibration. Everything is in movement. Or as it says in the Kabbalion, nothing rests, everything moves, everything vibrates. So what they're explaining here is that nothing 
in nature is static. If the universe is alive, it's a living being, it's in constant movement because nothing living is static. That movement can be understood as a concept of vibration because all forms of reality and movement are happening at different levels of vibration. So we can understand different concepts like sound, light, uh, magnetism, there are different kinds of vibration. Hermetic tradition goes further to say consciousness, mind, spirit, they're all different planes of existence that are occupying different frequencies of vibration. And so the degree of experience or evolution, they say, is a matter of acceleration. The example they give to help as, as a kind of an analogy, they, they suggest if there was some kind of a spit, like a spinning top that you could spin on the table, but for the sake of the analogy, that this spinning top would continue to speed up exponentially. It would just continue to get faster and faster and faster. As it would speed up, eventually it would start to emit a noise, kind of a low grumble. As it continues to speed up, it would progressively escalate through the seven scales of music until it's going so fast that the sound would become high-pitched and then eventually inaudible. It would be on a frequency that we wouldn't be able to hear. And let's say it continues to spin beyond sound. Now it starts to heat up because it's moving so fast. And so it goes through the different degrees of heat, another, another level of vibration until eventually it starts to light up because it's getting so hot. And so it's a dark red, which then becomes orange, yellow. And if it continues to spin, eventually it goes through the spectrum of colors until it's a brilliant blinding white. And eventually it's going so fast that it becomes imperceptible to sight. Now, obviously there's no spinning top that you can do this fast, but we know there are things that can move fast and we know about the speed of light. These things are operating at different vibrational frequencies. Again, hermeticism goes further because it says that if that acceleration continues, the material dimension will dissolve, the atoms will separate, it will disintegrate into mind and speed up further, it'll eventually become spirit. It'll become the essence. Because all of these things exist, contained within the universe, they're simply experiencing different speeds of vibration. Matter is so dense that its vibration is low and it, it seems imperceptible to us. It just looks like it's not moving. But most science now reflects that all matter is simply energy moving at a very slow vibration. The hermetics would go and say it's not just energy, it's mind. But that idea has been there for thousands of years. Where is this useful for us? If we understand uh, vibration and frequencies, we understand resonance because what vibrates resonates and the way that we vibrate will resonate. And what we resonate, we draw to us. Music is a very good example because in terms of vibration, it's pretty clear. If you listen to um, beautiful music, inspiring music, it resonates a certain way, heavier music, um, more bass music, it resonates another way. Now, I'm not going to tell you what kind of music you have to listen to. I personally like a bit of Black Sabbath every now and then, but with moderation, because you can imagine if you're always vibrating at a very heavy frequency, a very negative frequency, a very aggressive frequency, that's what you're resonating at, and that's what you're drawing to you as well. So everything is moving. To evolve, we have to accelerate. What does that mean? If, if that means, well, then to evolve, I have to go faster. Not quite, because we can make the mistake of thinking that, okay, I need to do more. And suddenly we get very overwhelmed very quickly because we try to do more, but it's about quantity. 
vibrating also means you know looking at different directions it's all movement we don't just have to go faster we can also go deeper we can increase in depth we can elevate our perspective we can open inside open our heart open our mind they're also vibrational frequencies and that is a different way of looking at it because rather than saying well i have to do more perhaps i can just focus on doing what i already do better with more attention more heart more presence and in that way more efficiency that efficiency helps me to develop more capacity so that then i can do more but now i won't be overwhelmed It's a useful perspective because our tendency, again, with, with the way we look at things often is quantity over quality. We think, I have to do more to be better. Not necessarily. We can do what we're doing, just do it with serenity, do it with generosity. Okay, so the next principle, the principle of polarity, says that everything is dual everything has poles everything has its pair of opposites like and unlike are the same opposites are identical in nature but different in degree extremes meet all truths are but half truths all paradoxes may be reconciled so everything has its opposite and these opposites exist on a, a spectrum or a scale what separates them is degree. This is a principle that sounds simple, but there's a lot to it in terms of how we can address, or as it says, reconcile paradoxes. We're very black and white often in how we see things, and we, we put things as diametrically opposed, and then they can't be reconciled. But in reality, most of the time, they're opposites of each other, and so they can be reconciled. Simple examples hot and cold hot and cold are just uh, degrees on the spectrum of temperature so you know where does hot begin and cold end as you continue up the scale of hot it's always going to be hotter than the last thing so it's not a simple black and white matter it's understanding that these polarities exist but if we understand where the opposites are we can revert the polarity it's very warm in here, so I have a fan. We can change things by uh, working with the opposite. If they belong to the same gradient, they can be reversed. Often they reverse themselves if we go to extremes anyway. If you travel far enough north, you end up going south. So understanding how things are related and how they are opposed to each other can help us to resolve them. They have to be related, for example, love and hate. Uh, love can lead to hate, but hate can be transformed into love. Love can't be transformed into east or hot. It has to be related to an opposite. But we can apply the principle to courage and fear. Down the bottom of the scale, we go towards fear. We activate our courage we practice courage we elevate our perspective we can develop courage and we can reverse the polarity this is an aspect of what the hermetics refer to as mental alchemy because here we're transforming or transmuting lead into gold we're we're reversing the polarity so that we're able to transform the state the state of mind and by transforming our state of mind, we change our behavior, our actions, our impact in the world. Okay, so with all of these keys, all seven as we're progressing through them, you can see that they relate to each other. They're all interconnected, like the law of correspondence suggests. So it's not just one thing. They're all part of the same law. It starts with everything being related to the mind, then it becomes uh, related to 
the principle of correspondence. Everything is interconnected. Everything vibrates. Everything has its opposite. And the next principle, rhythm, everything has its cycle. Everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates. So because things are diametrically opposed, because there are opposites, there's a rhythm like a pendulum swing that goes between these opposing forces. It's a compensation that offsets the polarities. It doesn't mean necessarily that we swing always from one extreme to the other, but as far as we swing one way, we'll swing the other way naturally. And cycles are a very natural aspect of life, which we can observe easily. Uh, from the seasons to the moon, the tide, um, day and night, breathing in and out, nature operates constantly in a complex series of cycles. So they say that the cycles are inexorable. It's unavoidable that the rhythm of life will affect us. But we can minimize its impact on us because obviously the, the degree of that swinging back and forth can attribute to a lot of the chaotic nature of our experiences. We're all over the place, as we would say. So how do we, how do we minimize that oscillation? How do we minimize the swing? Well, if you're, imagine that you're hanging off of a pendulum and you're swinging back and forth. The point of movement is lowest the higher you go. If you're down at the bottom, you're swinging back and forth. If you're right up at the top, at the fulcrum, you're not barely moving. So the key to balance is elevation. If we can elevate ourselves, our perspective, from the experience that we're having, the oscillations of rhythm are minimized. They never stop, it's part of nature, but how impacted we are by it is reduced. If you imagine that you're, you're cycling on some kind of a, a mountain trail and it's up and down and there's valleys and it's treacherous and it's rough, that's what we're like in a lot of our problems. We're in it, we're in the middle of it, we're pulled all over the place by it. If we elevated, if we were in a hot air balloon instead, you could look down and you'd see the path, see the mountains, see the ups and downs, but you're above it. It's not to be in denial of the reality, you can see it, but you can experience it with a perspective that allows you to maintain your stability. The next principle, the sixth, cause and effect. So again, just to kind of keep connecting everything together. They say that everything is mind. They say that everything is connected. They say that everything is moving. Everything has its opposite. Everything has its rhythm. Ultimately, because of that polarity and rhythm, there is also cause and effect. Karma, as they refer to it in the East, As they say here from the extract from the Kabbalion, every cause has its effect, every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to the law. Chance is but a name for law not recognized. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. I love that chance is a name given to law unrecognized. And that's how we treat karma a lot of the time. We, we feel like when things happen, there's no reason for it. But it's simply that we are oblivious or ignorant for whatever reason of the causes. And there are laws that we accept and there are laws that we don't. We, we accept gravity. We don't generally have a problem with that. We accept that water boils at 100 degrees. We're all fine with that. If you try to boil pasta with room temperature water, you'll agree, it doesn't work. So there are laws that we're fine with, but cause and effect, karma, the idea that we are responsible for the consequences of our actions, how much do we accept that? Not always. 
And so instead we feel that it's chance. Things are happening for no apparent reason. It's other people's problem. It's the world. It's the pandemic. It's everything outside of my control is determining my state of being. So the law of causation is an invitation to reflect on what's happening and why without turning yourself inside out, but to observe and to question with some honesty, what hand did I have to play in my current circumstances? And again, this isn't so that we blame ourselves. This isn't, it's not about anything, you know, that we deserve what's happening to us, but we need to understand that what's happening to us is for a reason. And most traditions explain that that reason is because we can grow from the experience. This isn't, this isn't always easy to accept, especially in difficult circumstances, but even in the most difficult things, perhaps above all in the most difficult things, we have tremendous opportunities to learn and to grow and to overcome. It's not something that imprisons us because we always have the free will to decide what cause we generate, but we're then conditioned to accept the consequence of that. In the causes, we're free. In the consequences, in the effects, we're conditioned. And as they say, everything generates effects. And if it's the same cause, it'll be the same effect. So it's another interesting point of reflection. If I'm frustrated with something, it's not working, am I actually trying something different? Or am I still doing the same thing, maybe dressed up slightly differently? because the same action, the same cause will generate the same effect regardless. The seventh principle is the principle of gender. And they say gender is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. Gender manifests on all planes. Perhaps a controversial concept today but actually could go a long way to reconciling a lot of the issues that we have in this subject. First of all, we have to understand when we talk about gender in these terms, we're not really talking about uh, physical gender. Yes, it expresses itself in that way, but what the hermetic tradition is explaining is that the concept of polarity of gender exists in all planes. Something that's that helps to understand this, if we look at the Tao, we mentioned Lao Tzu earlier. Uh, the Tao is the combination of yin and yang, active and receptive energies, masculine and feminine energies. We made a huge mistake a long time ago with electricity, calling them positive and negative. We still have it on the batteries. You got the little plus and the little negative, the little minus. So the association always is that one is better than the other. The masculine energy is positive, feminine energy is negative. Terrible totally incorrect, and it's created a, an awful association with all of this that is erroneous. Much better, active, receptive. Masculine energy is active, feminine energy is receptive. Both are equal, but not the same, like polarities on a spectrum. What's important is that through the harmonization of these opposites, we create life. Physically, we are able to create human life, but at the mental emotional level, combining the genders allows us to engender, to generate, to create ideas, sentiments. The higher movement that then allows us to inform our actions. And they describe in the, in the Kabbalion, they talk about the active and receptive masculine feminine genders of the mind. They call the feminine mind the womb mind. It's receptive, it's what gives life, what generates, but it has to have the connection with the masculine mind, which is more like a seed of will that's able to give life with the feminine mind to create ideas. And through that, we create. Otherwise, as I mentioned earlier, if we are in the receptive mind only, without activating the masculine mind, without directing a little bit of will, then what tends to happen is 
we are implanted with the ideas of others, which is to say we're conditioned to think a certain way by society, by those that tell us what to think or whatever. They describe it in the Kabbalion almost like cuckoos. You know, the way that the cuckoo will lay eggs in a nest. The mother comes home and her babies are gone. She now has other cuckoos. A lot of our ideas are cuckoo eggs because they've been put on us by systems, by conditioning, by education, by others. And we haven't thought enough for ourselves. So this principle of gender helps us to understand mentally, but in all levels, the importance of the complementarity of these energies, active and receptive. We need both and we need them to work together. So in summary, the seven principles that the universe is mental, it is based in the cosmic mind. Everything is connected through the principle of correspondence. Everything is moving according to the principle of vibration. There's a polarity within that vibration separated by degrees. And there's a rhythm that compensates that polarity. All of that engenders a, a cause and effect. But underlying all of that, there are active and receptive energies that if we understand, allow us to engender ourselves, which is to say to be ourselves. As I said at the beginning, the, the Kabbalion is a fascinating read. I'd highly recommend it. But beyond reading it, there's an observation and a reflection there that's quite fascinating. Because these ideas may seem abstract. It's, it's up to each of us to, to think about them, to observe, to look at this, not just accept it, but to understand what does it mean? What's the implication of these principles in my daily life? Where perhaps am I ignoring them? Or if I feel that I'm suffering, is there a law that I've broken or that I'm going against? This kind of observation and reflection can help us through these natural principles to harmonize our actions better with the natural laws of life. That's the fundamental emphasis of Hermeticism and really most classical philosophy, to harmonize our actions with the laws of life so that we are happy and so that we can grow and evolve as individuals less in conflict with the natural flow of the universe.